Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes look at You did a great job with that. <laughs> that that was, thank you, Brian. Yeah, I didn't say that. That's just too kind of you. Cool. Those hombres. Yeah. Okay, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to our speaker today. I met David about actually six years ago. I actually figured that out actually six years ago. Though, when he was actually a candidate for this group, uh, working for a retail store in downtown Seattle. And um, we went and had a cup of coffee, and I was really, really impressed with his enthusiastic, very uh, positive approach to everything he's, he was doing. And I got his CNN history and all those sorts of things and tried to suss him out a little bit. And I was just very impressed with his, his presence more than anything else. And over the years, we've touched base, had coffee, had breakfast, and he's been doing all sorts of things which he'll tell you the story about. But he eventually shared with me that he wanted to be a Vistage presenter. He wants to do the circuit <coughs> and talk about this thing called gratitude. And let me tell you, he's a living, breathing example of someone who lives the message of what he's talking about. He has a natural passion for it, which he'll tell you about. And I, I'm just delighted that he's with us, our group today, with our spouses today, to share this fantastic message that everybody will get something out of, I'm absolutely sure. Please make welcome David Brook, everybody. David. <laughs> Thank you, Mary, for inviting me. Uh, by show of hands, how many people here have suffered a significant personal loss in your life? I think it's everybody. I am fortunate enough, I was telling Jim at lunch, I'm fortunate enough to speak to 18 year olds. I did a couple of commencement speeches here last month, and then I go speak at rest homes, so the average age is probably 80 or 90. And no matter from 18 to 90 or 95, it's anywhere from half the 18 up to the 95 year olds. You can imagine everybody raises their hand. So what I want to very briefly tell you about is my significant personal loss. It was September 29th, 1998. It was a Tuesday. I woke up and I looked over to my right to see if Dana wasn't there, my wife. It's strange. I wonder where Dana is. So I get out of bed. Connor, my four-year-old, he's about this high. Where's mommy? I don't know, let's go find him. So we walk, we look in a couple of rooms, and then Kyle, my 14-year-old, comes over. Joins us, where's mom? What's going on? We don't know, we can't find mom. So we walk down the hallway, we look down the stairs, and down in front of the washer and dryer, face down is Dana. She's all crunched over. We go running down there, I turn her over, all the stuff's coming out of her mouth and stuff. Connor immediately starts crying uncontrollably. Kyle goes, what's going on? I said, go call the fire, go call the police. Get people here as fast as you can. And in about four or five minutes, maybe, probably 25 people in our house. They take her out and they put her in the rec room area down there and they had these tubes and wires and paddles and all that stuff you've seen on TV. And it was the most surrealistic thing I'd ever seen. Because all I'd ever seen something like that was on TV and it was actually happening to me. Well, for those of you that have been through something like this, one of the things that you'll find is that time loses all measure. And I didn't know how much time had passed by, but a civil short fire person came over to me and said, Mr. Brooke, we've been working on your wife for an hour and a half. We still don't have a heartbeat. You want us to continue? And I sat and I thought about it. Even though you're in shock, your brain still manages to work a little bit. I went, wow, 90 minutes. And I said, no, you can stop. And she was dead. And she was 38. What made it really tough for me is that was September 29th, 1998, as I mentioned. But prior to that, my mother had died. My father had killed himself, a very prominent attorney. Two of my buddies, I was talking to Jim about going to high school. Two of my buddies died the night we graduated from Queen Anne in a car accident. A bunch of buddies in Vietnam. It just went on and on and on. And truthfully, I thought, this is just baloney. I don't understand why this is happening to me. And that day, after Dana died, two or three days later, the shock kind of wears off, and I walk up to the deck we had, we live by Green Lake, and I pinch myself, and I just thought, gosh, I'm just skin and bones. I'm just another guy trying to get through this world, another person. I don't know if I can do it. And that's the first time, unfortunately the last time, I realized in my life why people kill themselves. Because I thought, I'm just a mile from the Aurora Bridge. All I have to do is go over to war and go over down there and jump over the bridge and it's done. There's no more pain. 
Connor can't stop crying. Kyle goes, what happened to Monty? Why did she die? But I made a decision, I'm not going to do that. And I thought, they've already lost, they're 4-14, they've already lost their mom, so I guess I'm going to go jump off the bridge. That's not going to make sense. I'm going to have to raise these kids. But what I realized is that a lot of this comes back to <coughs> how you look at things. Now there's all these glasses of water, and it's always easy to do the glass half full, the glass half empty. I was having a great conversation yesterday with some people from the internet group about parents, roll glass half full, glass, glass half empty. But it does depend on how you look at it. So I'd like you to all stand up if you would please. We just got done with lunch, so it's always good to stand up and stretch a little bit. And I want you to take your right arm, extend it up, and turn it in a clockwise manner. We're in a digital world, so if anybody's uncertain, there's a clock face. This is this is people, the high schoolers go, which way to clockwise? <laughs> it just cracks me up. So keep, it, keep it going clockwise, and then stretch it out, and then just start slowly bringing it down. Slowly bringing it down to the top of your head, eyes, nose, chin, chest and about to your waist. Now what direction is it going? Who said that? Christian? Good job. Sit down. <laughs> Good job. And there's always a few people like Brian who are still doing it. <laughs> and it just warms my heart. I have these four or five fraternity brothers. Jim and I were talking about college as well. We get together once a month. And recently one of them said, you know, we've seen your little presentation to Frankie. We're not that impressed. <laughs> And yet at the same time, Gary goes, so how does this thing work? I go, okay, Mr. Masters, Mr. All Your Education. I said, it's nothing. It's just looking at it from the top and from the bottom. And it depends on how you look at something. And you get a choice which way you want to look at it. So one of the things that I thought about is I thought, well, how are we going to view ourselves? Because so much of who we are depends on how we look at ourselves. I heard a long time ago, the most important relationship you'll ever have in your entire life is one you have to use. So there's a couple of white cards. I'd like everybody to grab a 3x5 card. You'll see a red piece of paper. You'll see two 3x5 cards. Just take one of the 3x5 cards for the time being. And you are going to... Jason, do you have, are we still in the circle? That's good. <laughs> and so I want you to partner up. So Brian and Scott and just Debbie and Jason, just go all the way around. Get a partner. Somebody may have to move if you don't match up. Nolan and Scott and so forth. We're here. And here's what I want you to do. In the upper left-hand corner of that card, I want you to write, I see you as. Upper left-hand corner, I see you as. And to the right of that, write your partner's name. So Scott, you write Roland, Roland, you write Scott. And down at the bottom, in the lower right-hand corner, I want you to sign your name or write your name. And what's cool about this exercise, Christian and Dan, you guys know each other? So whether you know each other or not, it doesn't really matter. I'm going to give you two minutes for this. And here's what I want you to do. You're not to talk to your partner. I want you to write down how you see each other, the adjective, adjectives that describe the person. Happy, sad, energetic, you know, whatever it might be. How you see them just by looking at them, whether you know or not, go. And I'll give you two minutes. About 30 seconds. Okay, I think that's enough time. Now what I want you to do, I'll give you a minute or so, I want you to each, with your partner, read what you wrote about. Yeah, I think we're going to get this. 
to know here. somebody says about you, that's what gratitude does. Because gratitude helps you focus on everything you have versus what you don't have. 
and we constantly focus on what we don't have. People are always telling me, well, he's got the bigger boat, they got this, they got that. It's just ridiculous. It's a fool's game. You'll never win it. There's always going to be something that's going to be bigger, richer, stronger, whatever it might be. So embracing gratitude. Somebody said to me yesterday, you know, you ought to put the, the five things down here. So talk the first one's five things, or five things rather. The first one's embracing gratitude. By the way, how you look at stuff, what does this say, anybody that can read it? You just shout it out. Opportunities nowhere. Opportunities nowhere. Okay, anybody else? Christian? Opportunities now here. Good, John. Opportunities now here. <laughs> and then somebody said one day, there's opportunity snow here. And I went, what is <laughs> well, I'm not saying this is scientific, but there's a lot of people that are positive that, are, that say opportunities now here. And then people like my dad, who is the most negative, opportunities nowhere. Can't you see it, Dave? It's right there. <laughs> My dad was one that he killed, killed himself, unfortunately, I don't mean to be flipped, but that was 35 years ago. He was a very powerful attorney, and he got a shotgun one day. But I'd say, good morning, Dad. And he'd go, what's good about it? And I'd just say, oh, wow. <laughs> what a way to look at things. How did I get this way out of here? <laughs> but anyway, I will, I'm going to actually write them down when we have time. But the first one is embracing gratitude. I'm going to talk about five things today. Embracing gratitude is the first one. That's my exercise I love to do because it talks about if somebody sees you that way, why do you not see yourself that way? Blows my mind. Why are we so freaking critical of ourselves? Don't work hard enough, not good looking enough, too fat, it just drives me crazy. And yet somebody, a total stranger, when I met Jim, they this guy looks like he's together, he's smart, he's educated. You know, all these things, you know, he tells me a story, and I go, wow, just kind of what I thought, I just sat next to him. You notice in the first 10 or 15 seconds. Second thing I want to talk about is it takes as long as it takes. I am 64 years old, I know Jim was looking, he doesn't know I know this, but he looked at me and I thought, this guy doesn't look at Dale, we're 63. <laughs> <laughs> I know he was thinking that. <laughs> but I wanted to be a speaker when I was 19 years old. That was 45 years ago. Two years ago, I walked out of Lowe's and quit, and so I'm going to become a speaker. I did tell this to Jim, my Connor, my four-year-old, who was now 20, he was 18 at the time, and I come walking in, he goes, what are you doing home from work? And I said, well, I quit. And he quit Lowe's. And he goes, yeah, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to be a speaker. He goes, well, that's just super, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> what exactly were you going to do for food? <laughs> so, oh, please be nice. My so, just trust your dad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to meet people like Gary Pauline that are going to follow me. <laughs> it's all, all going to be part of the plan. But I feel very strongly about it. it takes as long as it takes. And there's many, many examples. And I, I, I try to balance sadness or, or tough stuff with humor and things that show people if you never give up, you can succeed at anything. When I did that speech at the uh, Kamiak High School, I said, I'm going to give you four words. And I was thinking of the just do it, some of these powerful words that people have come up with. And I said, be grateful, never quit. And I'm going to bring them up again at the end. And then I talk, these are all 18-year-old kids, probably 500 of them there. And I said, if, you, if you're grateful and you appreciate stuff and you never quit, I kind of think that's a success formula. But if you quit and you go jump off that bridge, pretty much that's the end of things. Anybody here a pilot? Jason is. I've been a pilot for a long time, so. Remember my instructor saying to me, don't ever give up. I went, wow, that's an odd thing to say. Don't ever give up. I mean, isn't it like check gas and <laughs> use a checklist and, you know, and I'll never give up? What's he talking about? So I went on and I, I got my instrument rating eventually, but I didn't have it at the time. And I was a VFR pilot. I learned how to fly. Visual so, flight rule. Correct. Thank you, Brian. Uh, can you get a car? <laughs> <laughs> and so I was all excited and I took my friends and my wife and my buddy and his wife and we flew down Ocean Shores. We're over Ocean Shores and and I remember all the training, but I mostly remember, don't quit. I thought, wow, why did, that, why did he say that? And so we're getting ready to land. It's at night to make matters worse. All of a sudden, the storm comes. I can't even see anything. I'm not even in some I've got maybe a couple, three hours under the hood. I know it's not much like that, Jason. And you're sitting in the storm? Yeah, and so I'm maybe 1,500. So I, we got to get back to Seattle. So I turned the plane. I do remember this. I'm coming out to... Uh, I think it was 048 and went back 228, something like that. So I turned back and I remember all the things they're telling me. And I turn back and then all of a sudden I pull up and the stall horn goes on. Because now we're going to stall because I'm so scared. And they're all laughing like, are we, are we not going to dinner at Ocean Shores? We've got better problems than that. Let me tell you. And 
And so as I pull back, I'm, I keep hearing the stall going, I'm at 1,000, 2,000. I'm going to hit a plane, a mountain, or something. But I was so close to giving up, I don't think I can do this. And then I look at the turn and bank, and we're in a 60-degree bank turn to the right. That's like over 45. And we're going to flip over, and we're going to do a John Kennedy Jr. deal. Yeah. But remember what he said. He said, don't ever quit. So I had a heading bug, so I turned that button on and brought it back to straight. Now I felt like I was this, because I had vertigo everywhere. But I was so scared, my heart was probably pumping 200 beats a minute. And I'm trying to be cool for Linda, and Doug, and Susan. And I just kept watching it 4,000, 5,000, 6,000. I'm trying to get a hold of Seattle Center, 3966 Mike, Seattle Center, we need radar vectors. Nothing. 8,000, 9,000. I just thought, we're, we're going to die. This is ridiculous. I don't know if it's, it's going to be something out here. 11,500 feet and break out of the clouds. I can see Seattle in the distance. And I go, let's go to Red Rod. <laughs> and we flew back and went to Red Rod. But I later told Linda and Doug and Susan, you have no idea how close we were to buying it. Because I said, I was so scared. I was making poor decisions. We could have another plane. We could have a mountain. We could have gone upside down. Everything. But I remember what Jay did. He said, he said, don't ever quit. And I didn't. And I got to find him again someday because that's really something I think saved my life way back when. So every one of your stories, I look around the room, every one of you has an individual story. I use PowerPoint occasionally, but the reason I don't like to as much is I like to look at Scott. He's got blue eyes, as Brian was talking about. Brian and Debbie and Jason. Let me see if I can do this. And Tom and Jonathan and Kathy <laughs> and Jim and Marlis and John and Kathleen. And Jane and Doug and Julie, Roland, Scott, Dan, and Christian. What about me? And Gary Blaine, Thank you. of course. And I will tell you why I do that. It has nothing to do with impressing me. It has to do with the fact that it doesn't take much effort to pay attention to people's names. And it doesn't take much effort to write what you're grateful for every day and get a gratitude journal, whether it's mine, I don't care, it can be a spiral. It doesn't take much effort to do things that can help your life a lot. But I really mentioned this too about the never give up. And yeah, Disney, if it wasn't for Walt Disney going out there and going to three or four hundred banks, we wouldn't have Disneyland, Sylvester Stallone, the Rocky movies. There's all these examples. And I remember that example of the plane. I told a story yesterday about Connor and baseball never giving up. And he hung in there and he struggled and struggled, but he didn't give up either. And so now Kyle, who's 30, and Connor, who's 20, are really, really doing well. And again, Jim and I were talking about our kids today. I'm just so proud of them, but the big thing, I tried to set the example for this, I'm not going to give up. I'm just not going to give up, and I think that's so important. So I think it's important to understand that, but I think the next thing, and I'm gonna, I'll write these down, is the embracing gratitude. This It takes as long as it takes. Everybody's journey, that's why I like to meet everybody and look in their eyes. You got from 20 to 60 or whatever the ages are, I don't care. It doesn't matter. I realized when I was 19 I wanted to do this, and it took me all these years well, I didn't have 40 years worth of stories like I do now to illustrate points. Because I'm not teaching out of some book, some book I read, you know, by Winston Churchill. This is the book of David Brooke. And these shoes, Scott and me can't walk, Scott and I cannot walk in the same shoes, but you can walk a parallel path. And you can know that we can emulate, uh, uh, have empathy for each other because of what we've gone through. So, it's this decision you make. There's a gal that... Uh, don't typically talk about other people named Molly in the group yesterday. She made such a powerful statement. She goes, I just made a decision to be a happy person. I thought that was so cool. John Lennon, I don't know if a lot of people know this, I didn't know this, but he was five years old. His mother said, I'm going to tell you the most important thing I'm ever going to tell you. You have one goal in life. John Lennon says, what's that? She goes, to be happy. Oh, that's pretty cool, pretty profound. So a few years later, John Lennon's in grade school. Teachers going around the room, probably like this, says to John Lennon, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he goes, happy. <laughs> Teacher looks at John Lennon and says, you don't understand the assignment. <laughs> John Lennon looks back at the teacher and goes, you don't understand life. <laughs> That's a true story. But it, it really is true. So I, I think that... Embrace gratitude. Gratitude is such a phenomenal thing. You see people all the time. I'm going to touch on this a little bit later when I talk about the businesses that you're in and the people that you hire. And what if we talked about maybe finding people that were grateful? What if, what if we found, asked them, instead of all these tests these people go through, what if
what are you grateful for? Are you grateful for your parents? Are you grateful for this job you had? Are you grateful for the opportunity just to interview here? Uh, just a thought, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But before we get there, I want to talk about the crap that's in your brain. And again, the reason I do this, back, back to the low power ones, I get to look at every person. And Christians already said a couple things that crack me up, for instance. So I don't think I can do that if I got my little thing and I'm doing like this. And then, the people, and then they do it and they just read what's on this. I could just give me the dang PDF. I just, just read it. God. Anyway, I can look right at John and say, it's like bigger than me. It's <laughs> but you got to get rid of stuff. When you go out to the cars, there's this windshield. It's like this deep. It's about this wide. It's pretty big size. I don't know what that is. 10 square feet, something like that. And then here's the rear view mirror. It's like this size. I think that's a good way to look at your life. Mostly what's in front of you. Now, if you're looking here, and you see flashing blue lights, you have to pull over. <laughs> I get it. There's a cop there. But mostly, you should look out what's in front of you. When I get to do workshops, we get a little bit more in depth. People start talking about stuff I mentioned yesterday about how their whole life's messed up because of their ex-wife and their ex-husband. And they drive over the crud, and then they just take it back here, and they pick it up, and they put it in front of it, and just drive over it again. <laughs> it just kills me. This lady says, yeah, well, it's easy for you to say, Mr. David, you know, but I have an ex-husband that messed me up big time, Mr. Ratitude guy. And I said, well, okay, when did you get divorced? It was 1988. <laughs> wow, that's a long time. So, and, I, and, I don't, and sometimes I don't understand when you give people stuff. So, like, Scott, put your hand up here. If you can so, Scott, who's obviously been lifting a few weights in his life, he's got a gun on there. So, so, I said, put up your hand, but then I say resist. But what does he do? Everybody does that. I never said push, push back. Push back. But people push back. It's almost built in. It's almost like a muscle memory or something like that. So, see the red paper? Grab the red paper if you'd be so kind. You would have fell on your face if you didn't push back. Emily <laughs> 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 Electric from my next job. What <laughs> is uh, <laughs> What you're about to write, you want your neighbor to see. So, what I'd like you to do, I'll give you 90 seconds. And on that red paper, I want you to write just you and the red paper. Don't look at anybody else. I don't want any of this kibitzing stuff. I want you to write as fast as you can in 90 seconds, and possibly the priority order, the biggest things in your life you're irritated with yourself that you did. Mistakes, judgments. Miscalculations, like what was I thinking moments? I cannot believe I did it. Go, I'll give you 90 seconds. and act. 
afterwards or look at a book or something, they go, I have no regrets. That's a dumb exercise. And I said, well, I'm really happy for you because I know a lot. When I first did this exercise, I said, can I have like 10 minutes to write every boneheaded thing I've ever done? I thought, are you kidding me? And I'm not going to let this junk in my brain affect me anymore. As I mentioned, red paper for your neighbor can't see it, but also the green light you mentioned means go, the red means stop. You want to stop being over these things. So I'm now going to give you 30 seconds on the clock. And I want you to rip it in as many pieces as you can in the 30 seconds or the rest. The most pieces I'll give a book to go. When you're done, just put it in the pile right in front of you when you're done. You can't rip that just on it. I did it. One of the words here says, make fun of it. <laughs> okay, stop. Put the file in front of you. I'm pretty sure Dan won. Is that you said it, Christian? Yeah, Dan's pile looks the biggest. That looks pretty good, Yeah. Jason, we've got some mini pieces there. By the way, when I'm checking this out, be really careful with this because I've watched people on breaks try to put together their neighbor's red paper <laughs> just to kind of see what they wrote. Which I go, that's baloney. So you didn't do this by weight. <laughs> speaker saying, if you want to change your life, change your life. I thought, well, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> and I thought, but you know, it's actually kind of true. It's like people that are, I need to lose weight, but can I get another bag of M&M's? Yeah, or can I get another muffin? I mean, it's like, if you really want to change, you got to change. And that's why I like the windshield and the rear view. Mostly pay attention, get rid of this garbage. Everybody has an individual list of things. We don't get to know what it is. But it cracks me up. It's like driving into cul-de-sacs. And those big square things that are to the left, there's usually two or three of my believer garages. They're, I think they're meant for cars. <laughs> and you drive by, the doors are up, and it's just floor to ceiling boxes. And then there's just like this little teeny thing where you see the guy going like this to kind of get to his stuff. <laughs> wow, who has that much stuff? <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, some people have it between their ears. <laughs> and you've got to get rid of it. And that's why I said it's very personal. And I, I get to have fun with people and meet a lot of people, but there's certain actions I don't do. Don't talk with your buddy. This is not you. This is just you and me. You're you and the, the junk that you've had in your brain. How are you going to get gratitude in there if you got it filled up with all those boxes? There's a lot of crud in there. And I think we can change in a second. I think we can change in a minute, an hour, and a second type of thing. I was kind of telling Jim a little bit about my history, and I'd worked in Lord's for a long time. I got eight promotions in 15 years, and I was a store manager and all this stuff, and I think it was just one thing I did better than anybody else, and that was the golden rule. That's why I never forget names. Just don't forget names. I knew every single one of those 550 people that worked at Northgate, my biggest store. Wow. I knew their kids' names. Wow. I knew everything. Because it's important. You know? Uh, Brian said Kathleen changed his life. He had two kids. He used to be a stoner. I mean, you know, there was all that. I mean, you listen. Look at the impact Kathleen had on Brian. Just pay attention. How many kids? I think he said two, right? Pay attention. Adam so, and Christopher. Adam and Christopher. See how we're that. AC. But you know, it's just, it's a matter of making the determination that you're going to do it. And I've noticed too, having been a business owner, and you're all business owners, consultants, coaches, whatever, I do a lot of coaching and so forth. 
There's so many people out there that talk this big game about I want to do this, this, and that, but then they actually do what it takes to get there. Talking earlier about finding good employees, and I'll mention that a little bit later. But I had to be the person that set the good example. So when I'm running this Nordstrom store, and the only thing I did to get all these awards is do the golden rule. I remember people's names. I would always start a sentence with Dan, will you do me a favor? When you're done with the red things, do you do this? Take it over here and I'll get you a soda and this espresso bar. You treat people with respect. I can't believe how often we don't do that. But you can change in an instant. But I didn't always know that. So I'm like on my way up the chain, and I think I was maybe my third promotion. I was managing suits at Northgate. I started selling, and then I did some dudes of buying them. And I'm up there and sell. I'm in the lunchroom when I've been winning these awards, department manager, best suit sales, all this kind of stuff. This guy in the lunchroom says, can I talk to you a second? And you Dave Brooke, the guy that's running the suit department? I said, yeah. He goes, uh, can I tell you what the word is about you and I'm in here? The what? The word is. What's the word about you? And I go, sure. He goes, uh, everybody in the store thinks you think you're pretty hot stuff. So. I'm like, wow. That's so I, I don't mean to be. I'm just, I just got here a year ago. Yeah, we've been winning all the awards. and. You know, you get the you get the highest percentage, and the store manager loves you, and blah 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 blah. And everybody thinks you think you're cool. I said, but we know this. Uh, one of the things you don't say hi to anybody. I guess you just think you're a little above everybody. And I remember thinking, wow, that is not good. <laughs> I'm going to go places, whether I remember names or not. That is not good. So I went literally like that. I'm going to change in this instant. And the escalators would go like this, crisscross. So I got my little briefcase. And I suit manager of my all business. And that was the escalator didn't go any faster when I said hi to people. <laughs> Same speed. What's going on, Jim? How you doing, Kathleen? How's everything in Brass Plum? You know? Debbie, <laughs> <laughs> how's Gary doing? Didn't go any faster. But people started changing their view of me. And I got so good at understanding how to manage employees. And I personally think managing employees and raising children is exactly the same. The number one skill you better have is set a good example. Pretty tough to say, I don't want to see you doing this, but I'm sitting here puffing away. <laughs> Try it. it <laughs> Connor, who was four when Dana died, if you met him now, he would come up to you and he'd say, Doug, I think my dad met you a few years ago. So I have one question for you. Did my dad let you get a word in edgewise? Well, <laughs> <laughs> oh, he does talk a lot. <laughs> So, well, I apologize for him. It's nice to meet you. I've heard good things about you, too, in your firm. You know, he's just like me. Kyle's just like me. They saw the examples. The same thing with those employees. I had employees everywhere that wanted to come and work at my store for one reason, golden rule, treat people the way you want to be treated. So I do believe so much you've got to get rid of this crud. I believe if you want to change your life, you have to make a decision to change it, and it's just that simple. So I'm going to write it down again on the next break. So number four. Gratitude journal. I have a good friend of mine who comes up to me one day several years after Dana had died and actually another friend said, you know, you're really, uh, you're not doing too well. I said, yeah, thank you. So I not only lost my wife, I lost everything. I lost my house, we lost the money, we lost everything. She was addicted to painkillers. She was hooked on Vicodin and Oxycontin. As I mentioned, she was 38. She went into treatment. She got arrested for prescription fraud. Her hands were behind her back like this. I'd never seen a person arrested before. And then she was in treatment three different times in Everett Province in Everett, Washington. So the third time I went to visit her, Dr. Dickinson says, I need to talk to you. David Brooke, come in here. Sit down. I need to let him know what you're up against. And they go, see all those people out there? There's a room about this size, probably 20 people or so. He's a doctor, architect. Fireman, policeman, I said those are all people that are all addicted to something. That's why they're here. I said, well, that's fine, but I'm really concerned about blonde things. I know. But I want to let you know what your odds are. She's 37 at the time. One in 20 will make it back to a normal life. That's all. And of the 19 that don't, half of them will be dead within the next year. And she was dead nine months later. And as dramatic and as sad as that is, when I listen to people in the business world talk about their employees or anybody, how hard it is to find good people or whatever the example might be, it looks to me a lot of times like it's one out of 20. 
Stu and I were talking about interviewing people and got how listed questions. I said, how many people he said one out of six? But it's just amazing. And I'll say to people, so are you the one or are you the 19 that's not going to do it? And of course, you can imagine, everybody, I'm the one. Well, those just go against the odds. But the question is, is how you look at that person that you see in the mirror. You have to make that decision. So Bob says to me, have you ever heard of a gratitude journal? I said, no. Has anybody here ever heard of a gratitude journal? Oh, wow. That's a pretty good number of people. Well, I had not. And he goes, uh, you're messed up and you need to get one. You just start looking at your life from a gratitude standpoint. I always think I have, but really never to that degree. So I ordered a gratitude journal. And it came. I got it from Amazon. And I put it on the shelf. Didn't touch it for three months, which is ridiculous. But I didn't. And one day I thought I should start doing something here. So I started writing in it. And it started, everything started changing. And the interesting thing about my story is that I get to look at every single person's eyes here. I'll guarantee you a good portion of this room can tell me just as a dramatic a story as I'm telling you about my life. And I haven't even touched on another 10 or 15 people who have died and passed on other bad junk that's happened to me, but I choose not to focus on it. Back to focusing on what you have versus what you don't have. So when I started writing it, I noticed all these interesting things happening. And, and so at some point, I thought, well, I'll get my own little journal. So I made the Brooker's Daily Gratitude Journal. And I have a little saying up here at the top. It says, if you think about it, it's like a dream. If you think about it, or excuse me, if you think about it, it's like a dream. If you talk about it, excuse me, I'm just blowing it. And if you write about it, it empowers you. If you think about it, it's like a dream. If you talk about it, it inspires you. If you write about it, it empowers you. There's something about writing that makes such a huge difference. This is mine, and I write in every single day. Every so often, somebody will come up after a workshop, is this yours? And I go, yeah. You can look at it. You, know, and you can read them. You can read it. But they go like this. Wow, you're writing this every day. I go, have you been listening to the presentation? <laughs> Where were you? <laughs> my bookmark is my 20-year-old son's graduation picture. I can't see it from there, from Bothell High School, who was told he would never make it, couldn't make it in sports, was dumb. I had to hold him back in first grade because he suffered so much from Dana's death. He graduated with a 3.5, and he's a leadoff hitter on the baseball team. <laughs> Why? Because he never gave up. Unbelievable. He's now in San Diego going to school, and it's tough to deal with. I'll tell you, it makes a huge difference. What do you do your journal? Do you have like a regimen of time you do it? Great question, Tom. Thank you for asking. I would say the majority of people write in the morning, but to me, it takes five minutes, by the way. And it all depends on when you struggle the most. I will tell you in a second about another little wonderful chunk of my life, and that is getting bipolar crap from my mother, which I got from her full bore. And she, she died of cancer. But she was manic depressive, and she'd burn half the house down when she was manic, and then she'd say, this other stuff, which I'll touch on in a minute, but I just thought, so my challenge is off in the morning. So I always, I was already up early this morning, I was up in the room, thank you Debbie and Jerry for the room, I was writing my gratitude journal this morning, made my little curry coffee. But one of my workshops, somebody made a really, really good point. They said, you may, if you write in the morning, reread it at night before you go to bed. Or if you write it at night, read it again in the morning. So it kind of uh, re-reminds you, if you would, it's faster to read what you wrote. But it always makes a difference. And I found that, that that's why that whole thing about when I was out to the school and a gratitude journal, and, you know, and, I'm, and kind of, and some guy in the back goes, Do you have an app? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I do have an app. And, and it's the Brokers Daily Gratitude Journal. You just press it. I'm so grateful to Barry Denny Pulling for inviting me to the Folks. Types it right there. Goes in there on July 9th, whatever today is. It's not the same now. It's not the same. There's something that I read the other day, and I watch people with their laptops and their tablets. We all have them. And somebody asked me what I did this morning. I was on my laptop a lot, sending emails and doing all the usual things we all do. But they actually said to type all this stuff on the laptops or tablets or anything is not the same connection you're writing. They had the scientific stuff that's come out. So to me, I like it, and it really, really makes sense. Well, thank you for that question, Alan. It's a great question. So let me tell you a little bit about how this works. 
And again, I'm very, I sell a lot of journals, but I'm never here to sell journals. People can get a spiral, it doesn't matter to me. But the way this is set up is it says the day and date, July 9th, whatever. Daily number, we'll come back to in a second. Here's two lines, current events, special occasions. That's simply so you don't have to have a diary also. You can do it all right here. What you're grateful for, we'll talk about in a second. The highlight of your day. And then the right-hand side, a lot of people are impressed with. It's called your gratitude intentions. You write what you're going to be grateful for that hasn't even happened yet. This is gratitude today. This is gratitude tomorrow. I was talking to, I think, with Diane yesterday. It might have been Margaret. Oh my God, it was Jane. I love that. That's the best. And I, I, I told somebody recently, I have all sorts of examples. I have 90 minutes. I have to make sure I'm getting enough information and the time allotted and so forth. So I try to talk fast. And, but I have many, many examples I don't use, but I'll tell you one. I started writing the right-hand journal, the right-hand side. I'm so grateful for the hundreds of people I get to talk to every week. And of course, the group started getting bigger and bigger. And then I spoke to a church. And there's 2,500 people in three services. And I'm like, wow. And then I started writing around that time. I'm so grateful for the thousands of people I get to talk to. It's a phenomenal feeling to walk off a stage or off in front of a group and have people go, boy, when you said this, when you said that, it's unbelievable. Again, I don't mean to be coming back to gym, but he and I were chatting at lunch and saying how when you find your passion, I don't care how old any of you are, it makes no difference. And I'm usually the oldest guy in the room. It doesn't matter. Somewhere between now and when you need to do something you're passionate about, for gosh sakes. And when people come up and hug me and they cry and they say all these things, it's the coolest thing in the world. But I said now, I'm so grateful for the fact that I get to speak to tens of thousands of people. And I was invited to New Day next year, the children's group, Craig and his brother, um, Mark Kielberger, at the, at the Key Arena, and it will be 15,000 kids. I'll get to do a seven minute chunk on that. So you plant, you plant all that here. So, so that is a perfect segue into. Um, <laughs> we're gonna get to use the phones pretty soon. It's just a little early. <laughs> Take the other little white piece of paper, if you would, the little three by five card. And here's what we're gonna do. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. I can take you out, Dave. We're going to use the phone. We're going to use the phone. We're going to use the phone. That's funny. Okay, so here's what I'd like you to do. And I want you to, and people go at different paces here. So the very first thing I want you to do on your card is write, if you can only pick one thing in the entire world you're the most grateful for, write it down. Whatever that is. number is a number between 1 and 10 and all that does is identify where you are in your day. 10 is maybe one of the best days of your life and 1 is maybe one of the toughest days of your life. So I want you all to think about where you all are right this very second. People always ask me, yesterday or today? No, this is very second. Where are you between 1 and 10? 10 is the best day, 1 is one of the worst days. So get your number, don't write it down, just get it in your head. Think about what that number is, and then I want you to raise your hands, and we're going to check the numbers here. So if you're between a 1 and 5, don't raise your hands. I never want to embarrass somebody who's having a tough day. But by show of hands, are there any 6s? Brian? 7s? Okay, 3 or 4 more. 8s? Oh, I have 8s. 9s? Scott? 10s. Okay? All right, so... Now, I usually do that in front of that first one. So you've written down the thing you're the most grateful for. Now I want you to now go look at that card, which you just wrote, and now I want you to write down the second most important thing you're grateful for in your life. So you got number one and you got number two. Okay, and for those of you that are speedy, there's one more thing you're going to write, and that is, I think around, it's around 2 o'clock, so it could be today, it could be yesterday. What was the highlight of your day, either earlier today or yesterday? What was the best thing 
that happened to you, either earlier today or yesterday, if you could pick just one thing, the highlight that somebody said, what was the highlight of your day, what would that be? You have to keep it clean? No. Because it's just your heart. <laughs> Be careful. You're not sharing that with us. You're not, you're not doing anything. It's just your car. You did as much as you could, Kathleen. I know. Okay, and as much as I know people get a kick out of certain things, I want you to read that card again one more time seriously and think about how grateful you are for what you wrote, number one, number two, and what the highlight of your day is. I never give hints. I know what they are for me, but I want these to be what you think of. And just plant that in your brain, and then I want you to think about this number again. Let's see if anything changed. Okay? So, rereading that again, one to five, don't raise your hand. How many people are six? Perfect, no sixes. Sevens? Sevens. Eights? Nines? Holy oh, cow, that's fantastic. Any tens? <laughs> Thank you. It's been great speaking with you today. This proves my whole point. <laughs> <laughs> this corner here between the cell phone and the. <laughs> Scott and Brian, thank you. I promised Kathleen I wouldn't heckle you. <laughs> well, you didn't take uh, your promise. <laughs> Kathleen made you everything that you offer. Uh, oh, so oh, it's oh, your fault. That's the way you're This is, I know, I know people laugh at a lot of things that I say, but I'm actually deadly serious because there's so many people that have died, and I actually don't think it's very funny. I think it's all about how you see yourself. Now, humor is a great thing. I like to think I'm funny from time to time. But the big thing is, is when people pass away because they can't take life anymore, it really bothers me. One of my all-time favorite movies was Top Gun, and Tony Scott just jumped off a bridge a couple years ago. Didn't want to live anymore. Philip Seymour Hoffman, phenomenal actor. Needles in his arm, dies. kids. <coughs> Mick Jagger's girlfriend, gorgeous. Her boyfriend is the, one of the most famous rock stars. She hangs herself in one of them. Hey, I don't understand it. And I always think, what if I had gotten a hold of those people and talked to them about how if you focus on what you have versus what you don't have? Now, I don't, I usually wait till after this is over, but I will tell you the number one thing that goes in my journal every frickin' day is how grateful I am to be healthy. Because when you even have your health, you don't have anything else. And I just refuse to take medication. I got that bipolar junk from my mom, killed my wife, killed friends of mine. They have burglaries and things in Bellevue. It was a gym they were talking about. Custom houses, homes, and so forth. But they they go to the cops come to the houses. And the front door has been smashed in, and they the computers and the laptops and the money and even sometimes guns. It's all there. What the heck? And they go in the medicine cabinets are stripped out of all medication. So it's really it's just it's so sad to me because at 64 I'm going to do this to 74, 84, 94. I'm going to be speaking in my 90s. I know I am because I'm going to take good care of myself and I'm going to keep delivering this message and I'm going to keep getting through to people. And the way that one of the ways it works really well is gratitude, and especially writing in a gratitude journal because it continues again to say this. I'll say it several times to focus on what you have versus what you don't have. But I will tell you, I have to practice what I preach. About a year or so ago, I woke up and I was a two, maybe even a one. I was so depressed, and I know I got that as I mentioned. I mean, Tom mentioned that question at what time I write in the journal. My mom, when I was growing up, before she died of cancer, would call me and she'd take a bottle of pills and she'd shake them. I was the closest to her of the five kids. I was second born. And she'd shake them and go, David, you either come over right now, I will take this entire bottle of sleeping pills, I'll be dead before you get here. <laughs> Did it all the time. How old? I was 14. Yeah, from 14 to 18. At 18, she finally got lithium and that kind of straightened her out, but it was brutal. And then Robbie and Jimmy and Donnie and Gina said, you better get over there because if she dies, it's on you. Great <laughs> siblings. But I know I got it from her, but I just I can't take it. I, I, I just cannot do it. I just cannot take it. It just is against everything because of Dana and everything else. So I thought, you're going to have to figure out a holistic, naturalistic way to deal with this. Well, this was a big chunk of it. So that day, 
I was actually at a speaking engagement that day at Burlington Chamber up in Burlington, Washington. So I got up and I was maybe, like I said, maybe not even a two, and I was just, what's the point? This is ridiculous. It's very personal, of course, but I gotta be honest. So I went down to Starbucks, I got my journal, and I wrote my gratitude journal. Got a latte, just sat there by myself. And I'd say that bumped me up to a four or five. I felt a little better. I'm usually an eight, nine, ten guy. So I went to Burlington. They grew 150, 200 people. I always like to make eye contact. I like to see everybody. You see all these people. Some look at you, some don't. Some are getting it, some aren't. It doesn't matter. But you get to see all these faces, not knowing what all these journeys are. So I'm done. I got my books. And they come up. And it's very, it's really cool. They line up. And they're waiting for me to sign the books and stuff. And this gal, because she's crying. She goes, uh, can I give you a hug? I said, sure. She goes, my name's Janice. And you just changed my life. I've actually heard that a lot since then. That was one of the first times I heard it. And I said, well, you know, Janice, thank you. Because I'm not so sure I changed it as much as I just gave you some tools that might help you. Because we're all on individual journey. We talk big games. We all like to put on these fronts and clothes and wear the cars we drive. And really, what's here is what's really important in that person in the mirror. So she said, well, I'm going to get a couple of journals. And my son needs help. And it was really, really cool. And then a couple other people were very emotional. And, you know, and I went out to my car, I lived in Bothell at the time, so I was in Burlington. And the first thing I thought was interesting, if you ever wonder who your best friend is, who's the first person you call when you get really good or bad news? I think that's one pretty good litmus test. So I was going to call Connor first and Kyle second. And I thought, nope. And I had this big smile on my face, and I realized I was a nine. I'd gone from a one to a two to a four to a five to a nine by the progression of things. And that day, I never had a drink of beer. I never snorted a line of coke. I never smoked dope. I didn't do anything. I just changed a couple lives and broke what I was grateful for. And that's the power of something like this. And it's just amazing how <coughs> I see so many people, and I'll say, well, they got a gratitude journal. Again, you can mind. It doesn't have to be. But it just was fascinating. Like, were you writing in it? I like, write in it occasionally. You like just brush your teeth occasionally, or you use deodorant occasionally. I guess occasionally it's okay. But every time I've ever written in that gratitude journal, the mastermind groups I do, the people that are in my workshops and things, tell me I've never not felt better after I wrote in my gratitude journal. You focus on what you have. So it's something that's very very powerful, and I really really I encourage people to. At least give it a shot. I um, I, don't, I try not to. I only tell portions of my story because I really want to. How can I help Scott? How can I help Roland? And how can I help Dan and Christian and whoever it might be? But I'd like to establish that I know what I'm talking about. I, I have tons of stories I don't go into. But I I married this other gal. I did tell this to Jim. We ended up losing the house out in Waffle. But she was always suffering with stuff. And then she says so. I'm depressed. I said, why is, I'm, I'm the gratitude guy. Why don't you write a gratitude journal? Here, I'll give you one. You know, you're married. Here, here you go. You know, so then she tries it for a day or two, and then she's not writing it. And I go, I'm not going to say her name. I said, well, how come you're not writing it? She goes, well, 